Uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Georgi Ken and as well as MQ for providing me this opportunity to deliver this talk. And uh, I'm assigned to talk on uh, the care as well as maintenance of hemodialysis catheters. That's uh, Balsar was access access is very important in care as well as maintenance in the in dialysis patients. And as you all know, hemodialysis is a life-sustaining procedure. And for performing hemodialysis, you've got various accesses required. The options include AV fistula, arteriovenous graft, and hemodialysis catheters. Uh, the access, of course, of choice is a fistula. But many a time what we see is that a proper or a proper functioning fistula may not be apparently ready before the initiation of dialysis. And usually you have proper maintenance and care of this access is very much important in to prevent any infections as well as to ensure the long-term patency of the access. So in the next few slides, I'll be discussing about how to care as well as maintain. This is just a, you can see that the vascular access at initiated initiation in majority of patients tend to be a hemodialysis catheter. So more than 60% of patients usually start their dialysis with a hemodialysis catheter. Now, there are certain advantages of using hemodialysis catheters. One, you have to wait for around uh, three to four weeks for the fistula to mature. You can use it immediately. It is safe to place and very easy to place also. In the, uh, you may, um, uh, no, during the dialysis sessions, no is required and the low initial cost so there's a, there are certain advantages for, for these catheters. But however, at the same time, use of these catheters do have their disadvantages. One, the mortal risk is quite high when compared to fistula because of the finger risk of infection. Over time, there is tendency of thrombosis and central vein thrombosis. This is so before going to the maintenance, let me just give you an overview of the hemodialysis catheters. Basically, there are two types of catheters. You've got the temporary catheters or the non cuffed catheters, as you can see in the figure. This and then this is the, then you've got the curved catheters. Don't have a cuff. They are used, usually used for temporary use for the initiation of hemodialysis, uh, either for acute hemodialysis or for a patient. I, I just as a bridge before you uh, put in a fistula or a uh, pump. So initially tunnel under, under the skin. So they have got a Dacron cuff in place. This is supposed to reduce the risk of infection. So these are the two types of catheters in place. So the two dialysis catheters, which I already mentioned, uh, this is the curved catheter which you usually use. These are stiff catheters. They are usually used for IJV and then you've got a straight catheters which are used for the femoral vein. The, the length and size of these catheters tend to vary depending upon the location where you are using it. So what are the uh, indications? Now you, when, when do you use these have failed temporarily like an acute setting. Um, uh, following an infection, following a leptospiral infection or some poisoning toxin, suddenly the kidneys have failed. And uh, for a short period of dialysis, you can use these catheters. Usually, in case of femoral catheters, usually is used use for around three. Quite high. And they're supposed to be removed before one week. And then there is the subclavian internal jugular vein. Also, you can place these catheters. And these are usually recommended to be used for 
that provide proper care is taken. Beyond that, again, the risk of infection is high. Now, these catheters are placed percutaneously over a wire. They, there is no tunneling. They do not have a cuff. And they can be easily placed at the bedside. You can use in the dialysis room on the bedside. So they can be easily placed for early initiation of dialysis. Now, as I already said, the indications are for really short-term use. That is less than 30 days vascular access hemodialysis. Mostly, uh, sometimes even in case of chronic dialysis, uh, you can use it as a bridge, provided that you can have a, you can create a fistula early and uh, get, get it matured by around four weeks. So uh, that's the duration you can use um, these, uh, this kind of um, uh, short-term catheters. Now, the contrary, these catheters are only intended for short-term vascular access and should not be used for any purposes other than indicated. And the uh, thing is that the catheters should not be left in the femoral vein for more than three days. And in case of subclean IGV, it should not be placed for more than four weeks. That's something which you have to remember. It should not be placed for a long time. That's about the main, the long term or the tunnel perm cap, which is used in maintenance hemodialysis. So these long duration. The patient requests dialysis for more than four weeks, or if, as the patients who have, um, uh, who, whom you cannot immediately place a uh, fistula, or if the fistula tends to mature um, for a, may the time, fistula may take longer time to mature, um, or if uh, in patients who have got failed vascular access or poor quality veins, in such settings you may have to um, use uh, the long-term dialysis catheters as a means of uh, vascular access. So these catheters. As you can see, these are also called tunnel catheters because they are so between the entry point and the exit point, it is tunneled under the skin, and there is a cuff which is in, in this kind of catheters. This cuff uh, gets adhered to the skin, and then granulation forms, and it's supposed to protect the uh, from the entering of microorganisms as well as adherence of uh, this uh, catheter to the skin. That's about the uh, the long-term catheters. Now, what are sites where you can use these catheters? It's the right internal jugular vein because this is in line with the right atrium. It's a straight course. It is easy to put, and there are not, not much many curves, and you get good patency and um, uh, with the, the right IGV perm catch. The next option would be a left internal jugular vein. If the right is throm so thrombosed or you're not able to access, you may have to resort to a right internal, left internal jugular vein. The problem with the left, left internal jugular vein is that uh, there may be two curves before it reaches the, uh, the right atrium. And uh, um, so um, the, the, the patency, uh, wise I said, that the risk of thrombosis is slightly more when compared to uh, the right internal jugular vein. And then uh, in cases where both these are exhausted, you can resort to the femoral veins. Femoral veins are usually used uh, for temporary access, but then in case if it's not possible to handle other access, you may have to resort to the femoral vein. The femoral vein, uh, the, the risk of infection is slightly high when compared to the IGV. So, and uh, this, the thing is about is uh, the subclavian vein is usually not preferred, unlike in central veins where you usually uh, have care people in, insert the, through the central subclavian vein, the hemodialysis catheters are not preferred to be inserted through the sub subclavian vein because of the increased risk of um, uh, central vein stenosis, which can end uh, subsequently if you need to put in a fistula, also this may affect the functioning of the fistula. So subclavian veins are not preferred. And uh, and again, in cases where these are not these all access are exhausted, you may have to resort to other places like uh, the lumbar veins or the transhepatic root. Now about the perm cat size, this is the fourteen. To tip length is quite important because when um, you are putting insertion of catheter. Uh, the dialysis person will be usually be with you. Tip length should be around 23 centimeters, and the left because there's a longer curve, you should have a 28 centimeters uh, cuff to tip length. And femoral veins, the, the the catheter tip should be located in the inferior nerve cover. 
So it, you should need to have a longer um, cuff to tip length. So this is a, a, the, it comes in various uh, um, uh, lengths as well as diameter. Now where should the tip of the catheter be located? So in long-term hemodialysis, the catheters should have their tips within the right atrium. So earlier it was the junction of the vena cava with the right atrium, but now it is said like it is better to be within the right atrium so that the um, risk of clotting and patency will be more. And uh, the central catheter tip location should be determined radiographically and documented prior to initial. Now after you put in the catheter, an X-ray should be taken and you should make sure that the uh, catheter is in position before you start the dialysis. So this is a radiographic image, the same. So you can see the tip is within the right atrium, somewhere about between the fifth space. Uh, that is the location where you aim the tip to be. Again, in a, uh, Uh, this uh, catheters um, can be quite the uh, same plane as the, as the, the palindrome catheters, and catheters do have holes in the sides also. Um, to uh, prevent this clot form, uh, this is the most often the only ones which we use this. Where you got the catheter split, the artery and venous lumen. And of um, late, we have been using the symmetrical tip catheters, uh, which is supposed to have better uh, patency and thus reduce the risk of clot formation. Right holes. Again, the, uh, the, the catheter, the, the cross section also, um, the different designs are the. So the catheter do have side holes. Uh, this uh, the, uh, the importance of side holes it prevents uh, the vessel wall from sucking. If it is sucked onto one of the sides of the uh, vessels, you have the side holes so that the, the flow is not affected. So that's uh, uh, briefly about uh, the the, the long-term hemolysis catheter, its designs and shape. The next is the, the, the important topic, but that is uh, how to care as well as maintain this catheter for their to, for maintaining their long-term patency as well as the reduced risk of infection. So first of all, well, after you insert the catheter, catheter is in place. The next step, you have to address the chronic hemodialysis catheter. We made sure our fluoroscopy, you made sure the catheter is in position. You need to check the patency, and for this, you have to attach a 10 ml syringe with sterile normal spline to each lumen of the catheter. And then you have to release the catheter clamp and aspirate blood through each lumen. Now, once the flow is satisfactory, you have to flush both the lumens with heparinized saline in amounts equal to the priming volume of each lumen. Now there is the, these catheters uh, at, at the hubs. They got and the, the, the priming volume is written clearly. So according to it depends varies according to length and size and as well as the manufacturer. So that is the amount of heparin you need to flush uh, put inside the lumen. And uh, once you uh, put the required amount of heparin, you have to clamp each lumen immediately. And if you don't clamp it immediately, it can be to air embolism. This is important. You have to clamp immediately. And uh, for addition, you can also switch the, the dressing of the catheter, which I will be discussing. And uh, one thing is that in, uh, in these catheters, which are made of polyurethane, um, acetone and PET containing patches or back tracing ointments. And uh, uh, then you, have to, uh, as I said earlier, you have to verify the catheter tip location with X-ray or fluoroscopy. So that's about uh, in the immediately after placement of catheter. Now, the next is um, what are the recommended dressing techniques? How do you dress the, um, the catheter? You, you have to first um, secure the catheter the, to the skin using one or two sterile um, tape strips. Either you can uh, secure it tape strip. If it's not available, you can use a pre-cut gauze dressing over the exit side. So you can use a pre-cut gauze dressing which is placed over the exit side, fitting it snugly around five millimeter gauze over the pre-cut gauze and the catheter. And the 
and then you apply a cover dressing over it and the, the cover dressing over the um, um, the, the pre-cut cross catheter and the leaving the extension legs exposed. And uh, for the, after that, you have to place an occlusive film style dressing. So over the tap, you can use the occlusive film style dressing, either the tagadam or the uh, the fixomal dressing you can place over it. So the, the the way to put this film style dressing is you have to cut a one to two inches slit in short side. So you have to place a slit in the short side occlusive dressing using sterile scissors. And then you have to remove the backing sheet and then you view the catheter side through the dressing on the skin. So the slit over the catheter hub. Now one side of you have to press one side of the dressing onto place while holding the other side of the skin. And then you partially remove the frame portion of the dressing near the catheter hub, which is already secured to the skin. Now overlap the unsecured side of the dressing slightly over the secured side to seal the dressing under the catheter hub. And then carry the edges. So you have to apply a um, style ghost dressing over that you can apply a fixomal uh, or the metagadam um, dressing as I just described. In each um, dialysis uh, you have and uh, it does, maybe you have to access the catheter. You may have to do uh, the change, change the caps of the catheter as well as dressing has to be done. And the important thing is that these all things have to be done in strict, strict aseptic precautions. And that is very vital to prevent uh, the infections from happening. And the most important thing is the proper hand hygiene. Hand hygiene should be done as um, per um, um, protocol. And you need to have a clean gloves to access the catheter. So you can use the access the catheter using clean gloves as well as remove the dressing and then you, you put on the sterile loss for the dressing changes. Surgical mask is mandatory when the patient has to wear the mask as well as the healthcare professional who's doing the dressing has to put in the surgical mask. Once you um, um, open the six side, you have to look at the catheter exit side. It should be properly examined for any signs of infection, any redness, any, um, uh, any discharge, and the dressing should be changed at each dialysis room. During each dialysis treatment, the dressing should be changed. And the catheter lower lock connectors do have with end caps attached. So they have got end caps attached to the lower lock. And these should be soaked for around three to five minutes in COVID on iodine and then allowed to dry before separation. So they should be allowed to dry before separation. And then carefully remove the dressing and inspect the exit site for the inflammation, which I already said. If there is any findings of any inflammation, infection, redness, uh, uh, discharge, uh, the, uh, the, the treating doctor, the nephrologist should be promptly informed. <laughs> About the um, exit site um, cleaning. Exit site cleaning should be uh, done using aseptic testing as uh, the outline. And uh, during each treatment, the exit site properly cleaned and for cleaning the chlorexidine gluconate. So this is a preferred solution for cleaning the exit site and the manufacturer and this should be allowed to air dry completely. After that you have to cover, cover the um, exit site with sterile uh, transparent semi-permeable dressing or you can use a sterile gauze also. The sterile gauze can be used or um, um, more comfortably the transparent semi-permeable dressing can be used. The sterile gauze may be preferred in settings where there is, um, the patients tend to have more um, uh, sweating or uh, if there is any discharge or if it's infection, uh, to soak in the fluid, sterile gauze may be tried. Now, about the recommended cleaning solution for uh, the catheter lock or the connectors or end caps, they should be soaked in povidone iodine for at least three to five minutes um, before removal. And uh, alcohol should not be used to lock, soak, or declot polyurethane dialysis catheters because they tend to degrade the, these catheters over time. And for the exit site, the preferred solution is chlorexidine gluconate. You can use povidine iodine and um, uh, glucosine patches. For exit site, uh, oil, you, can, you can give antibiotic ointments with the bacitraxin thing, polysporin or antibacterial uh, ointment can be used at the exit site. Now, post, uh, once the um, um, dialysis is uh, finished, uh, you have to uh, flush the arterial as well as venous lumen with a minimum of 10 ml of sterile saline. 
So you would flush with sterile saline. And uh, to avoid damage to vessels, you should not put too much pressure. So for this, you usually use a 10 ml or larger syringes are recommended because if you use smaller syringe, they can generate more pressure. Another thing is that uh, the apparent should be injected into both arterial and venous lumen of the catheter. And uh, the appropriate constant, um, the, 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 the volume is uh, the, written on the catheter hub. And usually the concentration chosen is between 1,000 to 5,000 per ml. pressure and apparent solution volume to lock each lumen must be equal to the priming volume. This is quite important because you have, if you, if you take um, less, again, there is a risk of clotting of the dialysis catheters there. And if you take more, some of these can escape through side holes also and can be systemic anticoagulation and the risk of bleeding is there. So that, that this is very important. Next is uh, um, the, uh, the, uh, the lock, again, the clean catheter lower lock. After you um, uh, take over the detach, uh, the, the, the liver lock connectors should be properly cleaned. The threads should be cleaned with povidone iodine. Make sure there are there are no 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 not any blood stains on the um, the, the threads of the the, the liver lock, and um, that should be done to prevent cysting hepatization. The the um, the, the hepatic solution must be aspirated out of both lumens. Uh, immediately prior to using the catheter. That's what's important. Before you use the catheter, the apparent has to be aspirated, apparent has to be aspirated out of the lumen. And uh, um, no further apparent is usually required for next 40 to 72 hours. That is about uh, the care, uh, the accessing care as well as the, the dressing of the hemodialysis catheter. So what are the things you should assess uh, uh, in, with regard to him, uh, the central vein catheters in hemodialysis patients. So this can be uh, uh, broadly uh, divided into following headings. One, you have to have a proper visual inspection, and then you have to assess the patency of your central veins. And then if there is any problem, you have to assess the what is the kind of dysfunction that is happening, and ongoing assessment has to be there during the treatment. So prior to step one, that is a visual inspection. So prior to each dialysis session, you have to visually inspect the exit site, which I already mentioned. That's very important. When you look for any redness, any discharge, any swelling, any bleeding, any tenderness, which might be a marker of exit site infection, that has to be noted. Again, you have to look at the patient. Is there any snacks or the facial swelling, which may be indicator of uh, a central vein thrombosis and any development of any collateral veins over the chest wall or, or, or the face? And also any concerns from the patient regarding the venous access, any pain or tenderness. Also, you have to look at the central veins. You have to look for the integrity of the lines. You look at the, in, in the, in the holes or any cracks. Uh, you have to look at the cuff location where the cuff has migrated. Many times, um, the cuff can get migrated, especially when you put in a new catheter. Um, uh, the the this uh, the diaphragm cuff takes some time to get added to the skin, especially it takes for at least four weeks. So during that time, the, the dialysis technician who's taking care should be very, very much vigilant while removing the dressing and all. Too much pressure should not be applied. The cuff can come out, um, and it should be done um, uh, very um, uh, properly. So the, uh, the cuff location should be um, looked into. Again, uh, um, uh, always say the next is the central vein catheter patency assessment. So you have to, before, uh, to, uh, prior to initial, you first of all, you remove the anticoagulation lock, and then you attach the syringe uh, and open the clamp, aspirate the anticoagulant, and then you discard the syringe. And then uh, to assess the patency, you, you attach another 10 ml syringe and aspirate 3 to 5 ml blood to check for clots and flow. Now, if you don't see any kind of any clots, you have to repeat the aspiration as insulin. That's motion three times to evaluate the lumen flow. And uh, once you did that, you find there are no clots and the vein, the, the vein is patent, um, uh, the catheter is patent. You have to flush the central vein catheter. And for this, you attach a 20 ml uh, pre-filled normal saline syringe and flush each lumen using forceful flush method. Um, uh, and uh, this is repeated on, on the other lumen. Uh, this will help to assess the patency of the, uh, the the catheter. If there is any problem with the patency and, and, and the, or if any clot is noted, uh, you have to look for the uh, reasons for this catheter dysfunction. 
So, so that once you feel that there is some uh, problem with the um, flow or um, uh, it's not able to flush properly, there is a catheter dysfunction, you have to assess and manage what kind of classified into non-thrombotic as well as thrombotic dysfunction. Now, um, and the non-thrombotic is a kind of dysfunction. If you look at, um, uh, there are the few possible causes. So one is kinking of the catheter. Once you initiate, that's the importance. After you put in the catheter, you take an X-ray image to see if the curve is proper. Sometimes there may be king of the catheter, which may be um, uh, the reason for the, uh, the catheter dysfunction. Uh, and then there could be cracks or leakage in the central veins. And uh, uh, the catheter may be, um, the tip might also migrate. Um, the catheter initially may be in position and sometimes the tip may migrate later. The cuff may come out uh, or the catheter may be malpositioned as you can see it is curved within the um, lumen. So these are the non-thrombotic causes. So an X-ray will help, be helpful um, to identify um, um, whether there's a king or a malposition of the uh, catheter. Once you are ruled out um, uh, the, the, uh, the kings or the malposition, uh, the other possible causes are thrombotic occlusion. Now, uh, what are the types of thrombotic occlusion? So it could be a partial occlusion, or uh, it could be a, like a fibrin tail, which is a partial occlusion, or it can be complete occlusion, mural thrombus completely occluding the lumen. So partial occlusion is a partial, uh, you can open the fluids, uh, but uh, there is some uh, resistance while flushing or aspiration, and the uh, flow through the catheter is kind of sluggish. It could be a partial occlusion. So there may be interlumbal thrombus not fully occluding the lobe. And here uh, there is a withdrawal occlusion where you are able to uh, in, in, in aspirate the blood. You are not able to aspirate. When you try to aspirate, uh, it is not nothing. Is but you are able to push in fluids. So that is usually due to fibrin tail, which acts like, like, like a valve. And when you try to um, suck, the blood doesn't come, but you are easily able to infuse. And there is complete occlusion where you cannot either in, in to infuse or withdraw the blood. That's a complete thrombus. Uh, now, criteria uh, which may help to control um, um, uh, catheter dysfunction. Uh, these are some things which you should know. One is uh, if you look at the machine related, um, uh, the blood flow, there's a decrease in blood flow, or in the blood pump rates, the blood flow rate comes below 300 ml per minute, uh, the rise in arterial pressure, or a rise in venous pressure and uh, the urea reduction ratio be below 65, the efficiency of dialysis coming down. So these are some of the um, things which might help um, to um, uh, which may be signs of catheter vein dysfunction. Again, from the patient side, the patient may complain of pain, uh, the bleeding as well as uh, suspected distress. So in most of the cases, uh, the, the, the cause for low blood flow is a thrombotic occlusion. Uh, like they could be an intralumen thrombus, partial occlusion, a fibrin tail, or a complete occlusion, or a fibrin sheath, which may happen over time, uh, blocking the, um, uh, um, the the catheter. So if it is intraluminal clock, you may have some resistance upon aspiration, and uh, but there may be some flow, but then uh, there may be some resistance. That is the intraluminal clock, which I already said. Again, fibrin tail act, acting as a valve. So you are able to um, um, infuse, but you are not able to pull out. And in some uh, some settings, when there is, you may can, can resort to line reversal. The problem with this again, line reversal, there is an increased risk of recirculation, deficiency dialysis, wow. and there is this complete mural thrombus where they come complete. There is you are not able to infuse or 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 you are able to um, aspirate or infuse fluids. So there may be some swelling, pain, tenderness, as well as engorged vessels can be seen. So fibrin sheath is a, like um, on, on, um, over time. Sometimes the, the, there may be sheath may may be formed around the uh, catheter. May initially act as a valve mechanism, and then subsequently it may engulf the catheter like a sock, and um, and um, it, it may uh, cause catheter dysfunction. Important thing is that uh, thrombus formation can occur within 24 hours. That is, fibrin sheath formation can happen within 24 hours. And this tend to continuously evolve over uh, weeks to months. So these are like the, the, the various um, the, the morphology over time of this fibrin sheath, and over time it can now form an organized sheath covering the whole of the catheter and.
So this is uh, the when the cathedral gets flawed, then uh, uh, the, the, you may not be able to continue dialysis. And the, the, there are what sort are of the consequences of this uh, um, I mean, this uh, hemodialysis inadequacy? Uh, that you may not be able to do a proper hemodialysis. Um, you uh, the the cathedral may have. Um, uh, the signs and symptoms of inadequate dialysis are the patient may show five signs of fatigue, uh, nausea. Those things may be uh, or, uh, the consequence of a catheter dysfunction. Uh, so, properly, a uh, proper may, patient maintaining patterns of catheters is very important. In um, uh, the thrombotic catheters, the risk of infection is higher, and this may um, uh, promote the catheter colonization and bacterial biofilm formation. Causing infection. The, 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 I will say after this, um, the, the thrombotic and non thrombotic occlusion of the catheter, the next and most important complication is the infection. Um, um, infections um, can be classified into uh, the exit site infection, um, and it could be a, the tunnel infection or it could be a general bloodstream, catheter bloodstream infection. So uh, if you can see in the picture, this is an exit site infection where you can see a redness and, and, uh, and that has some swelling as well as discharge coming out from the exit site. Uh, the dialysis person who is in charge should be properly examining the catheter exit site during each dialysis section to um, look for any signs and symptoms of uh, infection. The, in the signs swelling discharge. Again, Another important finding is a fever during hemodialysis. Now, the fever during dialysis, unless prone otherwise, it is usually due to the catheter infection and redness over the exit site, and there could be discharge from the exit site. So, if these are, they should be promptly informed to the nephrologist. And uh, if the site discharge is there, a swab should be taken for culture, and the nephrologist should be informed. Now, what are the investigations for catheter infection? You can send a complete blood count. And in case the patient is having fever, chills during dialysis, you are suspecting catheter-related bloodstream infection. You have to take blood cultures both from the peripheral um, um, veins as well as from the catheter. And, uh, catheter a tip in culture: if one catheter is removed, exit site discharge swab cultures can be taken. So these are the investigations for catheter infection. Exit site infection I already mentioned. There may be discharge tenderness, and swabs should be taken. And usually. We may manage with antibiotics, exit site antibiotics, as well as um, um, uh, systemic antibiotic therapy. Usually, rarely requires removal of the uh, catheter. The tunnel infection is uh, uh, the catheter, the entire length of the tunnel can get infected, and there may be the patient may have tenderness along the length of the tunnel, and there may be purulent discharge at the exit site, and this requires an IV antibiotics, and you can ultrasound if you take you can see the the inflammation around the um, catheter, and um, in um, some cases if the if it is, does not respond to IV antibiotics, um, and then you may have to exchange the catheter or put in another catheter. And finally, it's a catheter-related bloodstream infection or a systemic bacteremia where the patient may have fever with chills, and this may happen only during dialysis. Um, other, other times, the patient may be um, febrile, and um, uh, the, the, there may be, if you are ruling out no other focus of success, and in a patient on dialysis having fever with chills, it uh, most often, unless prone otherwise, it is a catheter-related bloodstream infection, and you have to take cultures on the central as well as peripheral veins. And the, in many cases, you may have to start antibiotics, and um, uh, in uh, and, um, antibiotics for at least two to four weeks may be given. In a uh, few few infections due to few organisms like Pseudomonas and Staph aureus, sometimes you may have to remove the catheter. Uh, in other cases, if um, you can try salvaging the catheter with the course of antibiotics and to see for the resolution of the infection. The importance of uh, this uh, the, uh, the catheter infection is that if you are not um, uh, if it is not properly uh, treated, uh, this can lead to infection elsewhere. It can cause systemic sepsis, can lead to osteomyelitis, endocarditis, septic arthritis, epidural abscess. So there can the infection spread elsewhere also. So the, the catheter infection should be promptly identified and appropriate antibiotics and um, um, maybe have to be started. 
in another consequence of this catheter dysfunction or catheter thrombosis over time is a, is a situation called superior vena cava syndrome where um, uh, the superior vena cava gets thromposed and um, the patients will have a this, this is clinically manifested as swelling of the face and um, uh, the, the neck as well as um, uh, collateral veins which can be very much visible on the uh, chest wall the patient will have edema or engorged peripheral veins a feeling of fullness severe headache so the, if such a finding is seen in the patient you have to suspect superior venal cavall syndrome and um, uh, and uh, the, the, the proper imaging or angiogram may be necessary to, uh, um, to confirm the diagnosis and appropriate uh, measures have to be taken so that, that so summing up i mostly function as well as the infection um i just um, highlighting the few important po points so uh, in uh, the, the dialysis technician um, may uh, find patients who with fever the fever itself and um, dialysis during dialysis most often it is due to catheter related infection and uh, um, uh, this should be informed and um, the some uh, where you look for the exit site as well as uh, the, some, uh, the the blood should be sent for cultures peripheral as well as ventral and the antibiotics should be started start. most often we start empirical treatment antibiotics which should cover gram positive and gram negative usually vancomycin and the combination of amitacin is given and um, next is in either a thrombotic occlusion or a non thrombotic occlusion uh, you can take an x-ray to see if there is any um, um, any king or malposition of the catheter once this is ruled out it could be a thrombus um uh, one way of managing is you can do a guide wire manipulation of the catheter to see if the thrombus can uh, this can be dislodged otherwise um uh, you may uh, can have a thrombolytic installation um uh, for um a um, uh, few minutes or uh, like a uh, day like uh, with uh, the uric and its lock can be um, given and um, if the um, uh, the flow does so it just uh, in natural the complications the fibrin sheath um, uh, you can a um, postal saline flush can be used thrombolytics may be tried but if it, most of them it may not um, respond to the treatment you may have to remove the catheter and in some cases a fibrin sheath stripping may have to be done if it is a king dialysis catheter which can be very well uh, be apparent on x ray um, you can um, manipulate around the uh, uh, this uh, insertion site and um, cut the king and uh, the release any tight sutures if, if it is present and uh, the and again x ray you can identify malposition catheters so that can be again um, um, you can um, um, the um, um, under fluoroscopic guidance you can um, uh, manipulate and um, uh, put the catheter back into position and uh, this is also important I always look for exposed cuff and uh, the cuff and uh, so whenever that the, the, the important thing is that in initial for 1 to 4 weeks there is uh, the chance of catheter coming out is more always make sure that um, the sutures are in place so we put two sutures uh, in the outside so those sutures should be placed the uh, sutures um, uh, um, become loose or sutures are there the the, the the nephrologist should be informed and uh, our, the, the sutures should be put back in place and other thing is central vein stenosis which is apparent with the facial puffiness and engorged veins of the chest wall uh, proper imaging may be required to confirm the diagnosis so that's about uh, the common possible complications and the trouble shooting and uh, other thing um, uh, you have to um, uh, take care is during the removal of catheter like in temporary dialysis catheter there is high risk of air embolism so this should be, should be properly um, um, before removing the catheter you should make sure that you have no heparin is taken on the day of the planned removal and the patient should be kept in a head down position and ask not to cough or inhale deeply during the removal so have to place an air occlusion or um, dressing with a general an, a amount of ointment and the patient should be observed for around 30 minutes and the dressing should be kept in place for at least 24 hours so this will ensure that there is there is a minimal risk of air embolism um, after you remove the catheter and again uh, there is uh, the patients will have doubt regarding whether bathing and showering is permitted and it is important that during the initial first four weeks uh, the exit site should be um, never be immersed in bath water and uh, especially in the first four weeks should be taken care the patient that the water doesn't come in contact with the exit site 
and showering is uh, usually best avoided and uh, only after the exit light sinus tract is become established you may if it, it is preferable to do showering and, uh, and if the patient prefers it should be preferably done prior to coming to dialysis unit so that you can you can change the dressings on that day and uh, in regarding swimming hemorrhagic swimming is generally discouraged because of fear of infection so um, that's about um, the, uh, the 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 things which you should take care while maintaining and um, the the catheter in dialysis unit thank you